Let's start in early 1857 in a laboratory in Bonn, Germany. That's where a physicist named Julius Plucker was working with an instrument maker named Heinrich Geisler to create odd glass tubes that were, according to Plucker, incomparably beautiful. Geisler and Plucker didn't know it, but these Geisler tubes were to change the world. They were the precursor to not only neon lights, but also cathode ray tubes, also called Crookes tubes. And without them, we wouldn't have television, oscilloscopes, or even x-rays. Moreover, the cathode ray tube was what was used to discover the electron. But how did Geissler tubes work? Why were they invented? And how were they changed by Plucker's grad student and by a man with a fabulous mustache? into the cathode ray tube. Ready? Let's go. Electricity, electricity. Geissler tubes started pretty simply. They were skinny glass tubes with metal electrodes, platinum wires at either end. The tubes were mostly evacuated, had the air removed with a pump, and filled with trace amounts of gas or vapors. Geissler had just invented a mercury pump and his friend Rumkorff was selling a device called an induction coil that would produce very high voltages. So they had all the equipment needed to do this experiment. But how did it work? Well, when the high voltage was placed across the tube, some electrons are ripped free of their atoms, leaving positive ions or atoms missing an electron. And the electrons go zipping towards the positive terminal. On the way, they recombine with the ions, creating visible light. The color produced depends on the energy level of the gas or vapor molecules in the tube, which is why different gases produce different colors. You need to have low pressure because if you have too many molecules, the electrons don't gain enough kinetic energy before they bump into an ion and therefore cannot produce light. Now scientists have been making sparks in evacuated chambers for well over 100 years at this point, an experiment called the electric egg. In fact, just a few years earlier, Rumkorff and his friend Quet had used the spark from a Rumkorff induction coil in an electric egg and had even added various gases or vapors. What made Plucker and Gessler's experiment so different is they weren't trying to make a spark through a vacuum or through gases. They were trying to electrify the gases directly and they were succeeding. Now Plucker was delighted with the colors that they were producing but he was mostly interested in how the light interacted with magnets, which is why his paper on the tubes was titled, quote, about the influence of the magnet on the electrical discharges in diluted gases. Catchy, eh? Geisler, however, saw the financial angle and started a business selling increasingly convoluted and beautiful glass tubes to the public as novelty items. Now, Plucker had a shy graduate student named Johann Hittorf, who 10 years later knows the Geissler vacuum pump would bubble for hours from an area that was supposed to be a vacuum. He decided the surface of the pump had moisture on it that would evaporate and make gases. He therefore used chemical reaction to remove that moisture and considerably improved the Geissler vacuum pump. He immediately used it on the Geissler tubes and found a surprising result. It seemed like there was a light coming from the negative electrode and it would hit the far glass and make it glow, either green or blue, depending on the type of glass. He then proved that the light was coming from the negative electrode by making a special L-shaped tube and noticing that the glass glowed across from the negative electrode. He also found that if he put any object in its way, it would create a sharp shadow. Hittorf called these rays of glow and deduced, quote, any point of the cathode is a source of a cone of rays. Side note about the term cathode. Michael Faraday came up with the terms cathode and anode years earlier. Cathode to mean where the electricity came from, anode to mean where the electricity went to. Now with a cathode ray tube, the rays of glow were obviously coming from the negative side. So that side was called the cathode, and the positive side was called the anode. But what were these rays of light, and why were they being created? 
See, electrons from the negative electrode and from near it were repelled by it, and a few bumped into ions and created a glow. However, there were less molecules, so many electrons made it all the way to the far glass with enough energy to cause them to glow with a color depending on the type of glass. However, because this light caused glass to fluoresce, Hittorf assumed it was just another type of ultraviolet light. In addition, Hittorf was a reserved man and not a very good speaker, so few people knew of his results. Now we go to an English scientist named William Crookes. In later life, Crookes was most distinguishable by his completely over-the-top mustache. Here's a caricature of him, and here's a photo. Anyway, Crookes came from a truly enormous upper-middle-class family. His father had five children from his first wife, and ready for it, 16 from his second. Crookes always loved science and recalled fondly that he spent his childhood, quote, reading any book of science I could find and generating smells and destroying furniture, although his family was mostly uninterested. Quote, I don't suppose any of my family even knew the meaning of the word science, and I was always regarded a bit of a fool. Despite his family's distaste, he went to college and became a chemist. In 1859 or 1860, he learned of a new way of studying chemicals by the light they produced when they were burned, called spectroscopy, and used it to discover a new element he called thallium for green twig. He then became fascinated with the relationship between temperature, light, and molecular theory. In 1869, a talented 16-year-old named Charles Gingham became Crookes' assistant, and by 1876, Gingham created a vastly superior vacuum pump for his boss. Crookes then used this new pump on a Geissler tube and found very similar results to Hittorf. Although at the higher vacuums, the tube itself seemed black and only the glass at the end would glow. In addition, Crookes moved the positive anode to the side to get it out of the way. Unlike Hittorf, Crookes was a fabulous speaker. For example, after a talk on the cathode ray tube, a friend wrote him that his wonderful experiments were quote, discussed at a thousand breakfasts this morning. Also, unlike Hittorf, Crookes had a vastly different view of what was going on inside the tubes. He didn't think they were beams of ultraviolet light. He thought they were beams of charged particles that could cause items to fluoresce. After all, as Plucker had first noticed with the Geissler tubes, the position of the rays could be moved with a magnet, and magnets were known to move current-carrying wires, but to not move beams of light. To prove his point, Crookes built a tube with a little wheel inside it and found that the wheel would spin away from the cathode and towards the anode, which Crookes attributed to molecular pressure. In 1879, he wrote, quote, we seem at length to have within our grasp and obedient to our control the little indivisible particles which constitute the physical basis of our universe. What Crookes missed was this radiant matter wasn't a molecule at all. For what he was studying, the cathode rays, are really beams of electrons. And electrons are not molecules. They're not atoms. They are part of an atom. They are a subatomic particle, meaning smaller than atomic. However, Crookes couldn't figure out a way how to definitively prove that his ray was made out of particles, nor how to measure its mass or charge. On the other hand, because of his experiment with the cathode rays, Crookes actually predicted the idea of plasma, photons, curved spacetime, absolute zero temperature, and that mass is related to energy, all back in 1879, the year Einstein was born. No wonder his friend Alice Bird told him he seemed, quote, like the magician of the future before whom no secrets are hid. Back in Germany, Heinrich Hertz, who had used Rumkorf's coil to discover radio, was sure that Crookes was wrong and that Hittorf was right and that the cathode ray was really a beam of electromagnetic waves. And he created an experiment with gold foil that he thought would prove it correct. The experiment wasn't as conclusive as he thought it would be, but it led directly to the invention of the X-ray machine. 
And that story is next time on The Lightning Tamers. Electricity, electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't. If you are interested in the history of how Hertz discovered radio waves, I have a video about that. I'm also planning on making a video about spectroscopy and how that was invented in three or four videos. And if you are interested in how Rumkorf invented his coil, I actually don't have one on that because he didn't invent it. He merely sold ones of very high quality so that many induction coils in the 1800s were known as Rumkorf coil. In fact, he was even given a 50,000 franc prize in 1858 for creating the most important discovery in the application of electricity. Shows what good marketing can do. However, if you're interested in the induction coil and how it was invented and how it works, you should watch my video on the invention of the Tesla coil because two thirds of it is about the induction coil. Finally, if you've watched my previous videos, you might have noticed that my old subtitle was A Secret History of Electricity, and my new title is The Lightning Tamers. Please put in the comments whether you like The Lightning Tamers better, whether you like The Secret History of Electricity better, or whether you don't like either one of them. And if you don't like either one of them, do you have a better idea? Okay, thanks a lot. Have a nice day.